Lord Justice Bean sits on the bench remotely. We now deliver a short oral summary of our open judgment in this matter. The open judgment follows three days of hearings closed and open in October 2023 and one closed hearing on the 2nd of February 2024. Our sub summary is not in substitution for, nor does it form any part of our open judgment, which we are handing down separately in writing at the end of this hearing. Copies of that written judgment are available uh, together with a written press summary. The neutral citation for our open judgment is 2024 EWCA Civ 152 and will appear on the National Archives in the normal way. Shamima Begum was born in the United Kingdom in August 1999. She lived and attended school in Tower Hamlets. Her parents are of Bangladeshi origin, and through them, Miss Begum had Bangladeshi citizenship, at least until her 21st birthday. In February 2015, Miss Begum, then aged 15, travelled via Turkey to Syria and aligned with the organisation ISIL, Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant, also known as ISIS or Daesh, which controlled territory described as the Caliphate. She married an ISIL fighter soon after arriving. She went on to have three children, sadly none of whom survived. She was still in the Caliphate when it collapsed in January 2019 and was taken to a camp in northeast Syria. Section 40, subsection 2 of the British uh, Nationality Act 1981 gives the Secretary of State, in practice the Home Secretary, power to deprive a person of British citizenship if satisfied that deprivation is conducive to the public good. On the 19th of February 2019, without prior notice to Miss Begum, the then Secretary of State made an order depriving her of British citizenship on the ground that it would be conducive to the public good to do so because her return to the United Kingdom would present a risk to national security. There is a right of appeal to the Special Immigration Appeals Commission, SIAC, against orders for deprivation of citizenship made on national security grounds. On the 3rd of May 2019, Miss Begum applied for leave to enter the UK so that she could take part in her appeal to SIAC. Her application was refused. On the 26th of February 2021, the United Kingdom Supreme Court held that the Secretary of State had acted lawfully in refusing Miss Begum leave to enter the United Kingdom for the purposes of her appeal to SIAC. Ms. Begum elected to proceed with that appeal, notwithstanding that she could not give evidence or be physically present. On the 22nd of February 2023, SIAC dismissed Ms. Begum's appeal against the deprivation decision. The issue in this appeal, and for us, is whether SIAC was right to conclude that the deprivation decision was lawful. Ms. Begum put forward five grounds of appeal. Ground one, ECHR Article 4. The first ground was that the Secretary of State had failed to consider whether Ms. Begum had been a potential victim of trafficking for the purposes of sexual exploitation and that this failure breached the obligations owed to her under Article 4 of the European Convention on Human Rights. SIAC had found that there was, at the very least, a, quote, credible suspicion, unquote, that she had been trafficked for such purposes in 2015. It was not argued before us 
that this created an absolute bar to any deprivation order. We conclude that Article 4 of the ECHR gave rise to no obviously material consideration in the context of the deprivation decision. The Article 4 duties relied on were the operational duties comprising the protective and the recovery duties, the non-punishment principle, the investigative duty, and the restitutionary duty. In our judgment, there were two obstacles in the way of Ms. Begum's arguments based on breach of the protective duty. The first was that SIAC had found only an arguable breach of the protective duty by organs of the state, not actual breach. The second was the passage of time between the arguable breach in 2015 and the deprivation decision in 2019 and the lack of any causal link between the two incidents. The recovery duty did not extend to repatriating a former victim of trafficking if they had been trafficked abroad. Article 16 of the EC European Convention Against Trafficking did not assist the appellant in establishing such a duty. The non-punishment principle also did not assist Ms. Begum. There is no authority to suggest that the principle of non-punishment extends beyond criminal prosecutions. To extend the principle to a deprivation decision would go beyond incremental development of the relevant jurisprudence. The investigative duty and the argument that any investigation into the suspected trafficking in 2015 could only be effective if Miss Begum were present in the United Kingdom was not, in our judgment, an obviously material consideration for the Secretary of State when making the deprivation decisions. Three reasons for this. One, it would be tantamount to an obligation to repatriate. Two, it would be inconsistent with the Supreme Court's decision that the Secretary of State was not required to give Miss Begum leave to enter to present her appeal. Thirdly, any investigative duty is only to take reasonable steps, and SIAC were right to find that reasonable steps do not extend to repatriating a person assessed to pose a threat to national security. No restitutionary duty was owed in the instant case, as there was no established breach of Article 4. A possible or arguable breach is insufficient to trigger the restitutionary duty. Further, the asserted breach occurred four years before the deprivation decision. Further, the focus of a deprivation decision on the grounds of national security must, in our judgment, be the assessment of risk. We did not accept that an individual assessed as presenting a risk to national security must be repatriated, or even that the Secretary of State is required to consider repatriation in order to meet obligations which might be owed under Article 4. Ground 2. Trafficking issues at common law. The second ground was that the Secretary of State failed to take into account the possibility that Ms. Begum had been a victim of trafficking for the purpose of sexual exploitation. It was submitted that this was a breach of his duties at common law. Although the information before him did not discuss the case in terms of Article 4 or of the European Convention Against Trafficking, the Secretary of State was aware of the circumstances of Ms. Begum's departure to Syria, and the materials before him powerfully expressed the view that people who were children when they went to align with ISIL should be considered first and foremost as victims. The Secretary of State took into account the possibility that Ms. Begum had been a victim of trafficking. That assessment was kept under review after February 2019. SIAC was entitled to find that the issue of whether Ms. Begum had travelled voluntarily was within the expertise 
of the intelligence agencies. Voluntariness of travel was not a binary question, and Ms. Begum may well have been influenced and manipulated by others, but still have made a calculated decision to travel to Syria and align with ISIL. The assessment of the national security risk was, in our judgment, a question of evaluation and judgment entrusted by Parliament to the Secretary of State. Ground three, de facto statelessness. The third ground was that the Secretary of State failed to consider that Section 40 of the British Nationality Act 1981 prohibits the making of a deprivation order if the consequence would be to make the person concerned stateless. It is accepted that this means de jure stateless, that is to say, stateless as a matter of international law, and that the deprivation order did not make Miss Begum so stateless because she still retained her Bangladeshi citizenship as at February 2019. What was argued under ground three was that the Secretary of State nevertheless failed to consider that the deprivation order would make Miss Begum de facto stateless, since there was no realistic possibility of the Bangladeshi authorities permitting her to enter that country. SIAC held, and we agree, that it was sufficient that the ministerial submission and accompanying documents put before the Secretary of State when he made the deprivation decision indicated that there was no realistic possibility of Miss Begum being permitted to enter Bangladesh. It was not necessary that he should also have been asked to consider separately the concept of de facto statelessness. Ground four, procedural fairness. SIAC had held, departing from its previous case law, dating back to Al Jeddah against the Secretary of State for the Home Department, that Ms. Begum should have been notified of the Secretary of State's intention to make a deprivation order against her and should have been given the opportunity to make representations. We hold that at least a main purpose, if not the main purpose, of Section 40, Subsection 2 of the British Nationality Act 1981 is to protect the public from a threat to national security, which could be frustrated by a requirement to invite representations prior to a deprivation decision. Notifying a person abroad of an intention to remove their citizenship could enable that person to make a preemptive return to the United Kingdom and frustrate the purpose of the deprivation decision. Those deprived of their citizenship are afforded an appellate level merits review of the deprivation decision through SIAC. This distinctive right to appeal and the risk of preemptive action are in, are, in our judgment, compelling reasons to construe Section 40, Subsection 5 of the British Nationality Act 1981 as excluding any right to prior consultation before a deprivation decision is made on national security grounds, as was held in Al Jeddah. In our judgment, SIAC fell into error in concluding that Ms. Begum was entitled to the opportunity to make representations before the Secretary of State took the deprivation decision. In any event, however, SIAC was correct to rule that it was immaterial that Ms. Begum was not afforded the opportunity to make submissions prior to the deprivation decision. It was inevitable that the Secretary of State would have made the same decision regardless of possible representations made by Ms. Begum. Ground five, the public sector equality duty. 
The deprivation decision was exempt from considerations of the public sector equality duty under section 149 of the Equality Act 2010, pursuant to the exemption created by section 192 of the same Act as it concerned the safeguarding of national security. In this case, the public sector equality duty concerns were whether the exercise of deprivation powers disproportionately applied to British Muslims and or impacted detrimentally upon the relations between members of Muslim communities and others. In our judgment, the national security exemption applies to any exercise of function or powers. As such, the national security, the deprivation decision, was exempt from the duties that arose under section 149. The exemption did not require the court to undertake a separate proportionality assessment. In any event, SIAC had been correct to find that the deprivation power was exercised in a proportionate manner. In conclusion, for these reasons, we unanimously dismiss the appeal. It could be argued that the decision in Ms. Begum's case was harsh. It could also be argued that Ms. Begum is the author of her own misfortune. But it is not for this court to agree or disagree with either point of view. Our only task is to assess whether the deprivation decision was unlawful. We have concluded it was not, and the appeal is dismissed. Mr James Matthew, um, you will want time to consider the written decision in full. Our proposal, subject to anything that you'd like to say, is that we uh, will adjourn all consequential matters for a period of seven days. We would direct that the parties should agree a draft order uh, within that period, and failing such agreement, to submit short written submissions to the court by 4 p.m. next Friday. That's Friday the 1st of March, 2024. It's difficult for you to comment because you haven't seen the judgment. But does that sound like a realistic time frame for you? And if you need more time, then please communicate with the court in the normal way. Yes, Subject to that, we conclude with a, a repeat of our thanks to all counsel and solicitors involved in, in this matter. Copies of the written judgment are available to be distributed together with a written press summary. That concludes this hearing. Thank you.